you prefigured this a bit with your mentioning the difference between viruses and and us. But I'd like to um, talk about consciousness because you've 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 collaborated with a bunch of different people uh, and written some very interesting things about consciousness. Um, and my understanding is, you know, your stance is the free energy principle alone isn't a theory of consciousness. But my impression from your your writing on it is that you you you're kind of attributing consciousness to a mechanism of um, a kind of recursion, like modeling yourself to the point that you you get a kind of a certain level of self awareness, and that's the the key thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and you, you're you're absolutely right. The free energy principle and indeed active inference, I don't think, um, is at all. Um, um, a, a theory of consciousness. Um, uh, that's what Jakob Howey likes to say repeatedly, and I agree, I agree with it entirely. Um, and I should say, yeah, I have written about consciousness only because I have been asked to, or my young colleagues <laughs> are philosophers. I, 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 I am not uh, philosophically literate, nor, nor do I know very much about consciousness research. But um, from the perspective of um, the sort of the, the physics of sentience, um, then um, the, you know, the questions about different kinds of artifacts that um, may or may lo not look as if they were conscious to, you know, to different levels, um, usually reduces to the, the, the nature of the generative model um, that is, is apt to describe their behavior. And you know, I think the biggest um, distinction is one which we have been talking about for the past half hour, which is, do you have a generative model which would be fit for purpose to describe a virus or an amoeba uh, um, or a thermostat, which just talks about states of being and um, reflexively responds to bring those preferred states of being um, uh, you know, realize them through this gradient descent in the moment? Or do you have a generative model that entertains the consequences of action which you would need to plan? Now, both are perfectly, you know, you can find examples of um, very effective um, phenotypes, um, you know, all around us, and, you know, we keep referring to viruses, which is particularly pertinent at the current time. And, um, um, uh, but you know the kind of generative model that would be um, entailed by a virus, which is great for the virus, would would, would not be fit for purpose for us, and, and indeed existentially wouldn't wouldn't allow us to stand out as defined by that kind of generative model. Um, so, what kind of generative model do we have that a virus doesn't have? And I think it's as simple as, as what we have been saying: it's a, a generative model of the consequences of action. Now, that immediately tells you two quite quite sort of profound things, um, literally deep things. The first it tells you is that you now are equipped, or your body and your brain entail a generative model of the future. Why? Well, because the consequences of action have to follow the action. So immediately you've got a temporal depth to your generative model, which the virus doesn't have and doesn't need to you know, thank you very much. Um, um, but we clearly do have um, generative models of the consequences of action. So just being able to plan or systems that look as if they are planning um, um, can only be explained by an implicit generative model which has a temporal depth. The second thing that that's, um, the notion of planning brings to the table is that simply there being action means there has to be an agent. So immediately you're talking about things that um, um, have a generative model that at least have an implicit notion of agency. And then the question is, well, is the agency part of the generative model? So you can imagine, um, you know, sort of quite sophisticated creatures um, that could certainly plan but they don't necessarily have to have the hypothesis in their model that it is them doing the planning. Um, so you can imagine certain kinds of endearing pets can certainly plan and place themselves to elicit certain responses to make you take, for, take them for a walk or feed them or whatever. Um, and yet you, 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 you may not um, necessarily ascribe to them a sense of selfhood. Um, perhaps they were, they, they, were, they were lizards as opposed to um, kittens. Um, um, 
So it, you don't necessarily have to have a sense that you are the agent um, uh, in order to have a generative model which can uh, predict various muscle sensations or various secretory um, uh, consequences of, 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 of uh, internal secretions and interoception in order to have a generative model of the consequences of one action versus another action. So that suggests as an, you know, from moving from the generative model of states of the world to paths and plans and trajectories through state space and the consequences of action, we now have a second move that may um, be distinguished by the fact that this generative model now suddenly has become equipped with the hypothesis that it is me doing that um, um, do, you know, uh, generating those uh, consequences through some action. So now, mathematically, you have to ask the question, what licenses the additional complexity that would be um, implicit in adding another bit to your generative model? Um, so, um, before you um, you are actually noting that um, you know, there is, if you like, a certain efficiency inherent in minimizing complexity. Um, and I think that, that was quite in insightful and technically very important. So I just want to um, just briefly say, um, the, you know, not only is that common sense in terms of having the simplest kinds of generative models are those generative models that were generalized to new data and new contexts. Um, they were statistically much more efficient. In fact, they'll also be thermodynamically much more efficient. So um, there are various theorems, including uh, Landauer's principle, um, the Jarzinski um, equality, that enable you to show that the minimally complex models or minimally complex belief updating um, um, translates into the thermodynamically most efficient. So this is, you know, it literally costs you a certain number of joules to change your Bayesian beliefs, to change your mind. So if you can minimize the complexity, which is basically scored by the degree to which the data now change your um, priors to your posterior beliefs, the amount you've changed your mind, it costs energy to move further, which is why minimally complex models, hypotheses, fantasies, explanations, are those that require you to change your mind the least. So everything was nice and predictable. Your prior beliefs are perfectly adequate to provide, um, a, um, uh, to provide an explanation for this. Um, so that this fundamental imperative that rests upon, again, you know, I, I keep referring to this sort of um, dual aspect to good self-evidencing, you know, accuracy minus complexity, risk plus ambiguity. Um, that actually translates, um, that actually has an enormous um, 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 implication when asking questions, what licenses me, say I wanted to build self-awareness, say I wanted to build um, um, a robot with minimal selfhood. It would be trivial to do. I would just put a particular um, uh, belief hypothesis space you know, in encoded um, in silico um, where um, there was a hypothesis, I did that, you did that. Um, and then all the message passing in my deep neural network or my active inference scheme or my belief propagation scheme um, would um, uh, be um, fodder for or information for one hypothesis or another hypothesis. Um, and that would you know, enable me to test the hypothesis uh, that I did that as opposed to you did did that and accumulate evidence for that and, and my beliefs about whether I did that as opposed to you doing that would would um you know would tend towards some posterior belief and you know, no I did that 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 was me doing that so what I've done is build an artifact just giving it the hypothesis space just giving it the uh, the capacity to say uh, no that was me not you why would I do that if um I'm trying to minimize complexity well, I, it's only licensed if I live in a world where that extra complexity cost that I've incurred 
by equipping, say, a hierarchical generative model with this with this highest level of I did that or you did that or um, uh, or another person, another kind of creature did that. Um, if that pays its way in terms of the accuracy, if I can, um, if I live in a world where it is necessary to disambiguate between me and you, then that selfhood is in, um, inscribed into the model by equipping it with a hypothesis that it can actually, these things can be caused by uh, people and that person can either be me or you is only licensed in a world where that is worthwhile uh, or is necessary to account for these data. So you argue yourself into a situation where, yes, okay, I can see that equipping a robot with selfhood would be licensed. And it, you know, if I then you know, use the free energy to optimize the model itself or the, the Bayesian model evidence to do Bayesian model selection, I applied a bit of, sort of evolution to uh, natural selection to um, um, implement a bit of nat um, uh, Bayesian model selection on my robot. That, that selfhood is only going to survive in particular worlds. What are those worlds? Well, what, worlds in which it's necessary for me to disambiguate whether you did that or I did that, which means that I have to live in a world that is populated by other things that are very much like me. Otherwise, it makes no sense. So you end up um, from a purely mathematical argument by saying, yes, what you know, there could be um, certain generative models um, that self-evidence and do so with the right the the the, um, the right kinds of models um, that actually contain a minimal sense of self or the ability to infer I did that and you did that and implicitly there's an I that's in that inference a meanus um, um, that uh, that would be necessary but only in situations where that that, that disambiguation um, became um, became important. Um, and the, the, those situations are where basically there's lots of other things like me that could do the same kinds of things. So did I say that? Did you say that? You know, uh, um, when in communication or when, um, um, uh, say, from the point of view of a neonate, um, was was that me doing that or was that mum? Um, and, you know, working out who caused what may be one of the most important um, sort of, you know, hypothesis to resolve. But to resolve it, of course, you've got to have have the hypothesis that I am a thing. So as me as subject and me as object, or you as subject and you as object. And then from that, you can say, well, um, you know, having that hypothesis that has to generate an accurate explanation from the sensorium, how on earth does knowing that provide a more accurate explanation? Um, and it may well be that it's not so much the things we predict, um, but it may be um, the things that, that we attend to. So this is a slightly subtle move here, um, but I think it's you know, probably one sort of putting on the table because um, what it does is it sort of uh, brings attention into the game. Um, and that, you know, it may be that um, the, the reason for um, inferring agency may be really important when augmenting or attenuating various sources of information that um, um, will either confirm or disconfirm my hypothesis, hypothesis about what's going on. So technically that's um, usually um, mathematically encoded in terms of the precision or the negative entropy of various beliefs or um, various sources of information. Psychologically, that looks basically either as increasing the confidence or the uh, the predictability afforded to certain sorts of information that we're attending to stuff. And in other situations, equally important, attenuating, in particular, the consequences of action. So this is a well-known phenomenon in, in psychology called sensory attenuation. But notice that if I want to invoke sensory attenuation, which is basically ignoring the consequences of my own action so I can act first without, and ignore the evidence that I'm not acting before I've acted, if I want to deploy sensory attenuation as part of my inference, I actually have to have the hypothesis it is me acting. So, you know, it just it, it, almost um, um, for free, you get um, you get um, the kind of generative model 
that would support a minimal selfhood or um, 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 self-awareness um, if you recognize that um, there um, are certain um, uh, um, there are certain ways of attenuating augmenting uh, information in exchange with others and I'm thinking here about sort of you know communication as we're engaged in you know uh, you know while I'm talking I'm actually attenuating my auditory responses to what I'm saying in order to be able to say it fluently, whereas you're attending. And then I will stop doing that. But I can only do that because I'm inferring it's my turn to talk and it's not your turn, um, which means that I necessarily have to have a minimal sense of, of selfhood. And there are lots of people who've taken that kind of argument um, beyond the motor domain of articulating um, um, dialectic interactions uh, in communication through to communication with the body and interception and, 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 and sort of tying in um, the, um, the gut feelings and sort of Jamesian notions of um, sort of uh, senses of me and selfhood that is truly embodied and sort of blending, if you like, the this attentional aspect with the interceptive aspect to give a fully rounded um, at least conceptual model of the kind of generative model that you would have to have in order to be uh, to have a minimal self uh, um, minimal selfhood. The next move would be how do you know that you've got a sense of self? Uh, so then you so I'll stop there. But then there's you know, self awareness has not yet emerged. All we have is a minimal um, a minimal selfhood that we use to deploy our attention or attenuate our attention and to uh, infer uh, agency. But I may not be necessarily aware of the fact that I have a sense of self. So I may, may not be self-aware. I'm just aware that the, either I can do stuff or you can do stuff. So you know, there'll the, the, the be layer upon layer, a nice sort of a nice, um, an onion or hierarchical structure to the kinds of generative models.